thanks a lot for the nice introduction and thanks to everybody for coming. Um, today I'm going to talk about the volatile abundances in the lunar mantle from a melting cushion perspective. And I feel very lucky to have the opportunity to work on lunar samples which are very precious, brought back to the, to the Earth by Apollo missions. And here are some photos of when I was working on the lunar samples. These two photos uh, was when I was opening the newly arrived lunar sample 74 to 20. Uh, which is a very famous sample sample from the moon, and this is this photo is the first time I was touching the moon, <laughs> <laughs> and th I was not wasting any samples doing that. It's just some fine particles on the container after I worked on the samples. But uh, it's still cool to uh, record the uh, first moment I touch touch the moon ever. So here's the outline of my talk today. I'm going to first talk about the background of this my research, and then I'm going to go through the two projects I worked on during my PhD and uh, before we re reach the conclusions. First of all, why do we care about volatiles in the lunar, uh, uh, on, on the moon? Uh, the, the reason is that uh, related to the formation of our moon, uh, currently the most widely accepted model for moon formation is by a giant impact. And here's a video showing uh, the modeling of this giant impact. Um, it's, it's a very nice video and I've been watching, uh, enjoying watching it quite a few times. Um, so the most important thing relating giant impact to the volatiles is that in our traditional view, volatiles are expected to be, uh, to be depleted during this high energy giant impacts. So we are not expecting to see a lot of volatiles on the moon in our traditional uh, view of the giant impact model. Uh, so how about the knowledge of water on the moon? How do we previously thought, think? So before 2008, uh, most of the people are saying that the moon is bone dry with probably less than one PVV of water. Um, and, and famous scientist Larry Taylor used to say that he would eat his own shorts if <laughs> water is ever found on the moon. Um, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> and he said this for good reasons though, um, because from the samples returned for, uh, on the moon by Apollo missions, people saw metallic iron in the samples, which means there's no water to rust the iron in the samples. Also, there's a lack of water barrier minerals such as amphiboles from uh, all kinds of lunar rocks we have. And, uh, and pre any previously reported water detecting lunar samples turned out to be just per peripheral contaminations. So that's why people have th think that the moon is dry. But since 2008, uh, the measure measurements are actually down here in Eric Torres' lab. Uh, but people started to detect tens of ppm of water in lunar volcanic glass beads. Uh, more importantly, based on the modeling of the volatile degassing profiles in these glass beads, they interpret that over actually uh, over 90% of the water has been lost during degassing. So the original water concentration in the magma before degassing should be somewhere hundreds of ppm or even higher. And in 2010, three groups from uh, uh, three groups reported detection of hundreds to thousands of ppm of water in lunar appetites. Um, and interestingly, Larry, Larry Taylor was a uh, co-author of one of the papers reporting um, water on the moon. So after that year's um, LPSC conference, he re received some 50s of emails asking him, would you like to have a side of fries when you e are eating your own shorts? <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's a very interesting story uh, on the side, uh, but it also tells us that it's, it's pretty common for us to contradict with ourselves at some point in our scientific <laughs> career. Um, and more recently, people found that uh, uh, partition of water in appetite actually depends on fluorine and chlorine content in the magma, which means uh, in this uh, triplot of fluorine, chlorine, and, 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 and hydrogen, uh, the, uh, the appetite grains with high water can be produced with no difference from the ones with low water by just varying chlorine content in the magma. So that means the constraint of appetite data on uh, the magma water content has been uh, reduced. And in 2013, people reported six ppm, up to six ppm of water in lunar anorthosite. And this is struc structurally bounded uh, water inside the crystal uh, measured by FDIR, so it, it's, it's, there's no concern of contamination. And more importantly, this is a very, this is a very ancient sample so it may, and, and this is a direct product from the lunar magma ocean. So detection of water in this type of sample means that the lunar magma ocean uh, should have contained water 
at some point. Um, and based on the partition coefficient between melt and plagio uh, clays and melt of 0.01, and assuming the plagio clays formed at 80% of magma uh, crystallization, uh, the lunar magma ocean is interpreted to contain about 130 ppm of water. And for the melt inclusions, um, high, high volatile concentrations, more like volatile concentrations, was first reported by uh, Hori et al. 2011. Um, and uh, here's the image showing how a melt inclusion from this sample looks like. Um, and a more recent work by Chen et al. 2015 uh, looked at water serum plot. And, uh, and by comparing water concentration in the melt inclusions to their serum concentrations, we can uh, reduce the effect of um, partial melting and fractionation uh, on, on the scattering of the data. Uh, and, and, and they found that uh, sample 74 to 20 has very high water serum ratios, only a factor of two to three lower compared to the uh, mid-ocean ridge basalt on, on, on Earth. Uh, but they also found that the other, uh, other marathon inclusions uh, homogenized in lab have lower, much lower water serum concentrations. Um, the lowest one is about two orders of magnitude lower compared to 74 to 20. So that raises two question, questions naturally. One question is that uh, we see low water serial ratio in the homogenized melt inclusions, but the, they have been experienced uh, high temperature uh, during homogenization in lab. Is <coughs> it possible that they have low water serial <coughs> ratios because they lost water during the homogenization? So on the, in the lunar samples, most of the melt inclusions we found are something like this, uh, very opaque and highly crystalline. So it's usually necessary to do homogenization experiments that we can have a glass phase for precise electron microprobe and SIMS analysis. Uh, but during this process, one concern is that whether water and other volatiles can be lost. Another question is that currently the highest water concentrations in, in melt inclusions and water, high water concentrations in glass, glass beads are all from uh, 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 fire fountain <coughs> eruption products. Especially the 74-220, it has been famous since it's, uh, it's been brought to the Earth by Apollo 17. And many re studies have uh, reported high volatile concentrations uh, uh, on the surface of the glass beads in this sample. And some people argue that 74-220 uh, is a local heterogeneity uh, that might be enriched in volatiles. So we cannot use data from this sample to represent, represent uh, the lunar mantle. So for the next part of uh, my talk, I will, uh, let, we will discuss about the, the first question, whether uh, volatiles could be lost during homogenization experiments in lab. And as I just said, it is usually necessary to do homogenization experiments for crystal, crystalline uh, melt inclusions found in the lab. Um, and to figure out whether water and other volatiles could be lost during the homogenization, our strategy is to have two groups of melt inclusions from the same sample. And then we do homogeni homogenization experiments on one of them, and then we compare volatile concentrations between these two groups. And this is what we did. The sample we selected to do this study is 74-220, because uh, this is the sample uh, that has been studied extensively uh, in, uh, in previous work. And uh, we have a lot of uh, existing water and volatile concentration data for this sample. And what we did was we picked, handpicked olivine grains from uh, 74 to 20, and then put each individual grain into a high purity graphite crucible. Then we heat up the sample in a vertical furnace under uh, a high purity nitrogen flow. Uh, the nitrogen flow is for two purposes. One is that to one is to prevent the olivine being oxidized during homogenization. The other purpose is to prevent water from the air to get into the olivine during homogenization. And after the experiment, we polish the olivine grains <laughs> to expose the melt inclusions inside uh, and then measure them by electron microprobe and SIMS analysis. So here's a quick look of the results. Um, in each diagram, the, the, the top part is the histogram of, of concentrations in homogenized melt inclusions. And the bottom part is the uh, histogram of concentrations in the natural, condi uh, natural melt inclusions and, and the red bars represent the average concentration, concentration of each group with, with one standard deviation. 
So we can see that water concentrations in the homogenized melting solutions are very different from the ones uh, that are not homogenized. But for fluorine, chlorine, and sulfur, we don't see a significant difference between different two different groups. Another way to test whether water has been lost during homogenization uh, by diffusion transport is to plot the concentrations versus the radius of the melting pollution, melting pollution. And by doing this, we see that uh, the water concentrations in the melting pollutions correlate with their melting pollution radius fairly well. From the smallest one with only about 100 ppm of water to the largest one with about 700 ppm of water, uh, uh, they, the melting pollution radius affect the, the result concentrations quite a lot. And you can imagine this as like the larger melting pollutions are larger reservoirs of water and it takes more effort to, to drain water from the larger reservoirs compared to, to the smaller melting pollutions. Did I turn on the microphone? Um, and more interestingly, more interestingly, if we plot the natural data, it seems that there's also a trend in the natural unhomogenized melting pollutions. This means that a similar process could have happened on the moon during eruption of 74 to 20, causing the decrease of water um, concentrations, especially in the smaller melting pollutions. If we do the same practice for fluorine, however, we don't see a size dependence. The red circles, circles are for homogenized melting pollutions. If we compare fluorine concentrations in the smallest melting pollution and the largest melting pollution, fluorine concentrations are not <coughs> significantly different from each other. And also if we compare the average concentration in homogenized melting, melting pollutions and the natural melting pollution, they are all also within error. And we get the same conclusion for chlorine and sulfur. So the data we have gives pretty strong evidence that during the short time period of homogenization experiments, water could have been lost from the melting pollutions, but not fluorine, chlorine, and sulfur. But in order to understand um, our other experiments with, for example, different uh, heating dur durations and different heating temperatures, uh, we need a quantitative model to better understand our data. So in this model, uh, we assume a spherical melting pollution at the center of a spherical olivine grain, and, and water is lost from the melting inclusion through the olivine grain by 1D diffusion of hydrogen or olivine. So here's the plot of the original water concentration in the melting inclusion and in the, in the olivine. The concentration gradient in, uh, at the interface between olivine and melting inclusion is controlled by the partition of water between the two phases. And the two phases are also, also related by the mass balance of water. As diffusion goes by, uh, we have the transport of water gradually from the melting pollution through the olivine grain into uh, the, the gas in the, uh, in the vertical furnace. Given, uh, given more time, uh, we will have higher degree of uh, water loss from the melting pollution resulting in an even lower concentration in the uh, melting pollution. So now we have this model in hand. This model takes in four input parameters. The radius of the inclusion, the radius of the olivine, the diffusivity of hydrogen across the olivine, and the duration of heating experiment. And it gives us the output of degree of wa uh, water loss based on the four input parameters. To apply this model to our data, we need to convert the concentration in, and data into the degree of um, loss uh, after experiment. The way we're doing this is we compare the water concentration in the homogenized melting pollutions to the natural, to the trend, uh, nat natural trend observed in unheated melting pollutions. For example, we compare this, con this melting pollution to the original uh, water concentration expected without homogenization experiment, which is somewhere between uh, 400 ppm and 700 ppm. And we obtain a plot like this. So the trend is inverse because the smaller melting pollutions have lower water concentration. Therefore, they have, lost, they have uh, experienced, high, experienced higher degree of water loss uh, during homogenization. And the error bars of uh, the data are estimated uh, considering the, sc the scatter in, the, in concentrations of the natural uh, melting pollutions. 
So as we just said, this model has four parameters. For our data, the radius of the melting gluten and the olivine could be measured directly. And the du experimental duration uh, has been recorded. So we have only one free parameter, which is the diffusivity of hydrogen in olivine. So we can uh, use the model to fit our data. And you can see that the best fit curve goes through our data fairly well. Uh, this one outlier, outlier is marked um, in half-filled circles because we've, we've seen low uh, fluorine, chlorine, and sulfur concentration in this melting pollution compared to all other melting pollutions. And we, we um, suspect that this melting pollution might have cracks, cracks in, the, in the host olivine that resulting in higher degree of volatile loss during our homogenization experiment. And by fitting the data, we get a diffusivity of hydrogen of about 10 to the minus 10th meter, meter squared per second uh, in olivine. Uh, but what does it mean? Uh, how does it compare to previous studies and our understanding? So in this Arrhenius plot, we compare our diffusivity to previous experiments. All the symbols here represent previous uh, melt inclusion, hydration, or dehydration experiments using terrestrial samples. And you can see that our data falls onto a nice trend with uh, most of the previous data. This is telling us that the low oxygen fugacity uh, on in the lunar samples might not have been affected hydrogen diffusion in olivine. So uh, resulting in a similar degree of water loss compared to the uh, terrestrial melt inclusion. Uh, the two color patches in the figure represent two different different diffusion mechanisms of hydrogen in olivine. And our data is falling onto the, uh, uh, the, the lower mechanism region. <coughs> so with the model and the fitted uh, hydrogen diffusivity based on our experiments, we can, do, we can uh, model, uh, model the homogenization uh, processes by varying the olivine radius, the, temp the homogenization temperature, and the homogenization duration. <coughs> From, from the figures, we can see that for, for small melt inclusion, uh, there could be extensive water loss at, mo at most of the homogenization conditions. But for larger melt inclusion, for example, a melt inclusion with a radius of 25 micrometers or larger, uh, there's usually only less than 20% of loss, uh, no matter what kind of homogenization uh, uh, conditions we are using. So the getaway message from this part to the next part of the talk is that if we use large melt inclusions from lunar samples, we can minimize the concern of uh, water loss during homogenization to about 20%. And uh, now let's take a look back at the, at the data in the natural melt inclusions. We saw this depletion trend dependence on the melting, melt inclusion radius. What does it mean? What does it tell us? So uh, although the, the data in the natural melt inclusions are st scattering quite a lot, um, uh, by modeling the trend, uh, we still get some valuable information in terms of the cooling rate of 74 to 20. For example, using our model and our experimentally determined hydrogen diffusivity in olivine, if we model the cooling of 74 to 20 using a cooling rate of 100 centigrade per second or 10 centigrade per second, we, we are expecting uh, negligible loss of water even in the smallest melt inclusion. And the best fitting of the model tells us that uh, uh, 74 to 20 likely cooled down at a rate uh, on, the, on the order of one centimeter degree per second. Okay, so a quick summary of the results for this part of the presentation. First of all, based on our experiments, indeed water can be lost during even short duration of homogenization experiments. But fluorine, chlorine, and sulfur are not usually not affected. And the way to correct or prevent uh, the effect of water loss on our data is to use large melt inclusions so we can minimize the, wa the effect of water loss in lab uh, by about 20%, to about 20%. And also, by comparing our results to previous studies using tertial melt inclusions, we see that uh, <coughs> the low oxygen fugacity on, on moon has no observable effect on diffusive water loss, uh, at least uh, under the time scale of our experiments. Also, we conclude that uh, the cooling rate for 74 to 20 is only order of one centimeter degree per second. So for the next part of the talk, uh, we are going to talk about the volatile abundances in the lunar mantle based on lunar uh, based on melt inclusion data.
But before we get to that point, we have the second question, is that whether 74-220 is a local heterogeneity compared to other lunar samples. And the way we think, uh, we, try, we try to resolve this issue is, is by two ways. One is that we look at more lunar samples uh, for their um, water over serial ratios to see how 74-220 uh, compares to, to a larger range of lunar samples. And also, we look at other, uh, a, a longer list of volatile and volatile, uh, moderate volatile elements uh, in 74-220 and other lunar samples to see if 74-220 is different. If 74-220 is from a region that's enriched in volatiles, we should likely see a difference also in other volatiles um, and, uh, uh, in addition to water. So here are the five additional samples we studied uh, in addition to 74-220. Among these five Murray basalt samples, uh, no, no glassy or partially glassy melting inclusions were found in these three basalts. So we did uh, homogenization experiments on the large melting inclusions and measured uh, volatile elements in there. Uh, for Murray basalt sample 1020 and 74-235, we were able to find partially glassy melting inclusions uh, uh, so we don't need to do any homogenization experiment, and we can directly con uh, measure vo volatile concentrations in there. Um, so we measured, electron micro uh, measured the major element composition by electron microprobe. We measured volatiles and trace element concentrations uh, by, by seams in, uh, in Caltech. In, uh, in addition, we were also able to get some data by laser ablation on moderately volatile elements. Inside, the melt, inside one melt inclusion, one embayment, and one glass bead from 74-220. And here's a BS image of the, the melt inclusion we measured. And the, the orange circle roughly shows the region we ablated with the laser. And this is the time resolved spectra we obtained by analyzing this melt inclusion. The first 30 seconds is on the background, and we were able to get about 28 seconds uh, of data on the melt inclusion. And after the 28 seconds, uh, the beam drilled into olivine, and it, this is clearly indicated by the decrease in sodium and calcium counts, and also the increase in nickel and magnesium counts. That means we reached the olivine. So because there's, there's quite a lot of data, we're gonna go through the data in this sequence. First of all, I'm gonna compare different type of samples from 74 to 20 for understanding of volatility behavi behaviors during magma er eruption on the moon. And then we're gonna look at the new water serum plot with updated data. Uh, and then we will go through other volatiles and some of the moderate volatile elements. So in 74 to 20, we had the opportunity to measure volatile and uh, moderate volatile element abundances in three different types of samples. The first one is the melt inclusion. Melt inclusions are um, surrounded in olivine uh, crystal work. So they're not affected much by degassing during eruption. The embayments are similar to melt inclusion, but they're open to the exterior, uh, partially open to the exterior, so they could have been affected by the degassing. And the glass beads are just droplets of magma during eruption, so they are open to extensive degassing um, during magma eruption. So here we compare um, volatile and moderately volatile element concentrations in the three types of samples. In this diagram, um, the elements are uh, organized uh, in, uh, from uh, those with high half condensation temperatures on the left to those with lower half condensation temperatures to the right. And the vertical axis is uh, the concentrations uh, normalized to the concentration in the melt inclusion. So we have a, a clear view of uh, how degassing is affecting their concentration. And among the different symbols, uh, the, the solid, uh, solid red, red circle is the data in melt inclusion. They're normalized, so they all fall onto the line of one. Uh, the, the open symbols are embayment data, um, and the linear symbols are, melting, uh, are uh, glass bead data. So from this figure, we can see that water is the most volatile. It can be depleted to, uh, by two to three orders of magnitude in the glass bead. Chlorine comes right after after water, and it can be depleted in the glass beads by two to three, uh, one to two orders of magnitude. And then we have chlor uh, copper, um, uh, fluorine, and zinc uh, 
and they are depleted uh, by about 80 to 90 percent uh, compared to the male conclusion. And for um, for cesium, uh, for sulfur, uh, sulfur is here. For sulfur, gallium, and uh, rubidium, they are depleted by about 20 to 30 percent. And every other element is depleted uh, at, a, at a smaller degree compared to these elements. So this trend clearly tells, that, uh, tells us that we cannot predict the behavior of volatile elements uh, just, based on, um, uh, just based on their half condensation temperatures. And this volatility trend is also different from the trend uh, uh, by the experiments of Norris and, Norris and Wood in 2017. And tells, uh, it tells us that maybe the bulk concentrations in the magma and also the low pressure on the moon has an effect on the volatility scale. So now let's take a look at the water series um, plot with our new data. This is the previous plot we had in Chen et al. 2015. We, what we did was two things. First of all, we removed homogenized melting, melting inclusions that are smaller than 45 micrometer in diameter. In this way, we can minimize the, the effect of uh, loss of water during homogenization experiments. And also, we're adding new data, um, additional data from the newly studied melt, melt, uh, melt sam uh, lunar samples. So this is how the water serial plot looks like right now. Um, after excluding the effect of homogenization loss in, uh, uh, in lab, we still see a, vari a strong variation between uh, uh, in water serial ratios across different lunar samples. 74 to 20 has the highest water serial ratio of about 50. Um, it goes down to about 9 for 10 or 20, uh, and 3 for 74 to 35, and about 1 for other homogenized melt inclusions. One interesting correlation we, we observed in this data is that water serial ratios for different samples seem to be correlated with their apparent, apparent cooling rate. So the wa highest water serial ratio were found in the, melting, in the sample that most melt inclusions are found to be glassy. Inter intermediate water serial ratios are found in um, lunar samples that some of the melt inclusions are found to be partially glassy. And low water, water serial ratios are found in the crystalline, uh, the, uh, the more slower cooled lunar basalt samples uh, with uh, almost no glassy melt inclusions. And for the sample 12040 with the lowest water serial ratio, it also happens to be the one that cooled uh, co down at the slowest rate among all the samples we studied so far. Uh, it has an average grain size of one millimeter, and, and people have interpreted it to be cooling at a very slow rate. So this means that uh, the variation in water serial ratios across different lunar samples um, uh, might be partially due to water loss during, uh, under different time scales during cooling on the lunar surface. So how about other volatiles? Um, uh, 74 to 20 has high water serial ratios compared to other lunar samples, but does it have a uh, higher fluorine, chlorine, or sulfur compared to other lunar samples? Um, the answer is not. So in this diagram, we plot fluorine versus neodymium. Um, Data from 74 to 20 are plotted uh, as red open cir circles in here. You can see that it correlate, they correlate with other lunar sample, samples fairly well. One exception is data from 12040. It has a slightly higher fluorine over neodymium ratios compared to all other lunar samples studied so far. And because this is currently the only sample we found have different uh, fluorine neodymium ratios, we think that it might be due to secondary eff effects and not representative of the, pr uh, uh, the primitive information. Mm -hmm. Why do you compare fluorine to neodymium? Why not just neodymium? So these plots are selected. So we compare a volatile element to a refractory element uh, that have similar degrees of incompatibility. Okay. In this way, we can minimize uh, the variation caused by like crystallization yeah, and partial melting. Yeah. Um, for chlorine, um, we, we compared it with potassium, which has uh, similar incompatibilities during, um, uh, during partial melting and crystallization processes. And we see that all the lunar melt inclusion data fall onto a very small region. And 74 to 20 overlap with other lunar samples fairly well. 
uh, the figure for sulfur over dysprosium is more complicated. This is because sulfur concentrations in the melting inclusions can not, on, uh, can not only affect it by degassing, they can only affect it, be affected by sulfide segregation uh, during the crystallization of melting inclusions. So uh, I, I converted this plot uh, in a different way. So in this plot, we plot sulfur uh, dysprosium ratios in uh, lunar melting inclusions toward their host rock titanium concentration. And if we look at each individual sample, for example, in uh, 10 or 20, the, the two melting inclusions with low sulfur dysprosium ratios are uh, highly crystallized, uh, I mean partially crystallized. And uh, it, they, have, they might have been affected by sulfide removal from the melting inclusion. This one is a homogenized melting inclusion from the same sample. And it has much higher sulfur dysprosium ratio uh, compared to the, not, not, uh, the melting inclusions that are not homogenized. And in this sample, we were actually able to observe um, sulfides in the uh, natural partially glassy melting inclusion. And also, the homogenized melting inclusion has a high sulfur dispersion ratio. So, in, so because of the effect of degassing and sulfide seg segregation on sulfur dispersion ratios, we need to interpret the maximum value for each sample to be representative of the pre-degassing, uh, uh, pre-eruption values for this sample. And in that, w in that way, we see that the low, t low to titanium um, Mari basalts seem to have a lower sulfur dis dispersion ratio compared to the higher uh, titanium samples. But if we compare 74 to 20 to other um, high titanium lunar basalts, we don't see a significant difference. Um, how, how about other uh, moderate to volatile elements? How do they look like in 74 to 20 compared to other lunar samples? So in this figure, we plot pota potassium over barium ratios um, in lunar melting inclusion data, uh, which are shown in the color symbols, and, uh, and in lunar glass beads, which are shown in the, uh, cross uh, in the pluses, and also in the lunar basaltic data, uh, which are plotted as the uh, gray circles in the, in the figure. We can see that essentially all the data for potassium over barium uh, in different types of lunar samples fall onto a nice linear trend. And 74, 220 is right here. There's no difference between 74, 220 and other lunar samples uh, we've studied so far. We do the simil a similar practice uh, for sodium over strontium ratios. And, and all the lunar data, um, including data from lunar melting inclusions um, uh, in lunar basalts and, uh, and in 74, 220. And they all cluster around a small region. Uh, that means that sodium um, in 74 to 20 is also not very different from other lunar samples. And in this figure, we plot the rubidium data over barium data. Because we only have one data point in 74 to 20, uh, we don't have other data, uh, we don't have rubidium data in other lunar samples. We could only compare 74 to 20 uh, to other lunar basalts have been analyzed so far. And the gray circles represent lunar basalt data uh, reported in the literature. And 74 to 20 is falling uh, right onto the trend. So in this figure, we compare all the um, vo volatiles and moderate volatiles in 74 to 20 to other types of samples we have studied so far. The vertical, uh, the horizontal, horizontal axis is the log ratios of volatile over refractory element ratios in 74 to 20. And the vertical axis um, plots the, the, sam the same log ratio in different types of lunar samples. As we can see from zinc to sulfur, most of the volatile and moderately volatile elements have si similar uh, ratios in other types of lunar samples and in 74 to 20. Uh, except for the large variation in water serial ratios. So that tells us that it's unlikely uh, 74 to 20 is originated from a volatile enriched region different from other lunar samples we've studied so far. And therefore, the only variation in water serial ratios is better explain, explained by the, the different degrees of water loss experienced by different lunar samples through the crystallization of lunar magma ocean, the magma during magma overturn, um, and, and afterwards during the generation of their parent magma. Um, 
Uh, so, uh, th and therefore we can use uh, water theory ratios from 74 to 20 to interpret uh, the primitive uh, the water content in the primitive lunar mantle. If we assume the Syrian concentration in lunar uh, mantle to be um, BSC, uh, to be the BSC value, we get a concentration of about 85 ppm of water in the primi primitive lunar mantle based on water theory ratios uh, we've got so far. So with the volatile over refractory element ratios we've obtained, we can now also um, try to compare uh, their ab abundances in the lunar mantle to the tertial mantle. So in this figure, we, we, uh, we divided uh, the ratios we, we obtained in lunar melt inclusions um, to, box to the ratios in the bauxitic at Earth and then plot the ratios, uh, plot the comparison toward the half condensation temperature. And in this figure, the dash curve is the, um, is the trend suggested by Albrecht et al. 2015 based on the half condensation temperatures. However, the data we, we have obtained um, suggest that uh, are not falling onto the trend very nicely. Uh, the most distinct feature is that elements with uh, half condensation temperatures lower than 700, 700 Kelvin uh, are not as depleted as one would expect. And we, we interpret 74 to 20 to, uh, to be representative of water concentration in the lunar mantle. But uh, other, uh, the ratios for other samples are also plotted on the same uh, diagram as comparison. Um, so th the lack of depletion in volatile elements in the lunar mantle tells us that uh, we cannot simply rely, rely on the half condensation temperature um, to uh, interpret uh, water concentration uh, in the lunar mantle. Um, and, and such a lack of depletion also requires the um, formation model of the moon um, to either preserve uh, volatiles uh, or partially preserve volatiles during the formation of giant impact or um, delivery of such um, volatile elements into the lunar mantle before the lunar magma ocean fully solid solidifies. So about the question whether the moon is dry or wet, my opinion is that it really depends on the cri criteria for dry and wet. Um, so it needs, to, needs uh, additional work on the formation, of, formation model of the moon. Like I, I got 85 ppm of water, it's much higher compared to what people have thought before uh, on the level of PBBs. Uh, but as I talked with um, Mickey earlier, she, she argues that during the lunar disk stage of um, uh, lunar formation, water might not be efficiently lost. So she's expect expecting thousands of PBM uh, of water. Um, so I think it needs more work to constrain the model of, uh, of mo moon formation and really provide the criteria for dry and wet, wet moon. And I also think whether the moon is dry or wet is a temporal question. Um, the, the most related information to moon formation is the water content inside, uh, inside uh, the lunar magma ocean before it fully crystallized. And we might have uh, seen the part of the mantle after it's been degassed, uh, so we, we cannot really rely on all the samples to say that the moon started as dry. Um, and also, this is a special um, question, as I think. Um, uh, as I talked with Steve earlier, uh, he mentioned that uh, uh, the, lunar, uh, the lunar volcanic glass beads are from a much deeper origin from the moon. Um, so it's possible that uh, the moon ha still has water in the deeper part of its mantle, but the, uh, the, the shallower part of the lunar mantle could have been uh, experienced high, high de degassing loss. So the, the, s the shallower part of the moon could, have be, dry, could be dry, but the, the deeper part of the moon could still contain water. And, and another thing related to this topic is that uh, uh, most of the samples we have studied so far have strong European uh, anomalies. And that means uh, all of these samples and their mental origins have seen uh, plagioclase uh, segregation during the lunar magma ocean stage. Um, so uh, we, we don't have any signal from the primitive part when, uh, when plagioclase has not been crystallized yet. So for the conclusions, about the two questions we were trying to answer at the uh, beginning of the talk. Uh, first of all, 
we found that water could be lost from melting inclusions during homogenization, but other volatiles are not affected so much. And the effect, the effect is small on large melting inclusions with a radius larger uh, than 25 micrometer. And 74, uh, we found that 74 to 20 is very similar to other lunar samples studied so far in terms of uh, volatile elements and moderate volatile elements. So we don't see any evidence suggesting that uh, water, high water serum ratios in 74 to 20 is because 74 to 20 is originated from a volatile enriched origin. Um, and uh, we, based on the water serum ratios we obtained, we in interpret the lunar magma ocean to contain about uh, 85 ppm of water. And uh, the volatility trend we obtained for the moon uh, tells us that uh, the moon is not very depleted in volatile elements, which requires the moon formation model to either preserve uh, volatiles during uh, its formation or uh, delivery of volatile elements into the lunar mantle after, uh, before the lunar magma ocean fully solidifies. Uh, yeah, thanks for your attention. Questions? Yeah, go now. So from the plagio case, uh, the, the, the answer is 130 ppm, but uh, roughly within the same order. Your question is that the, whether the large impacts could affect vo uh, volatile concentrations in the in the lunar samples. Um, okay, yeah, I never thought about that before. Um, so f on small scales of impact, uh, actually impact uh, impacts could bring water to some of the samples on the lunar surface, but uh, I don't know for for the large scale impacts. I don't think so. Also, we don't see any signature like uh, the enrichment in highly siderophile elements in the source region of Mary Basalts. So we don't know if that's, gonna, uh, that, that's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, probably. Oh, okay. So this ratio, um, we, we are using the ratio because uh, if, if uh, the, the source region for high titanium basalts crystallize, it enriches in water, but it also enriches in cerium, right? So by dividing the ra uh, water concentration by cerium, we are assuming uh, the moon as a bulk. Yeah, still. Okay, okay, that's interesting to learn. Yeah, Steve. That's a good question. Um, so the low oxygen precarity on the moon, uh, if we use the model to calculate the dissociation of the hydrogen on the moon, um, I think uh, the per percentage of molecular hydrogen is somewhere 10%. So the majority of water will still be in OLS state, which, does, uh, which I don't think would affect um, the, uh, its compatibility 
has significant, but it could have affected it to get me not to testify. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
blood pressure at the nose and also right and left ear. Um, uh, but we don't know like how volatile this group is. Okay. Yeah, that was quite cool. Thank you. This one is for the There has been a stack for the That would be cool if we can get that. But I don't think I'm that would, that would That would be very cool. writing your third abstract? No, I think I'm I'm done here. <laughs> I haven't met Francis as well. Oh the problem is long too. You haven't met Francis? That's a very good question. Um, so in our model, we 
how they say this. Maybe more or less, it's difficult to visualize. Also, we don't think it will happen. Look at that. Yeah. 
So yeah, he stayed out. Oops, I didn't turn. That question about <laughs> the funnel eyes is on your next presentation. Mine is uh, let's talk with you. Oh. This one? Uh, Across. This is, a this is the plot I'm talking about. So the grid points are the same color stay down. Okay. So like they, they also form a similar trend. The, the larger ones are your color? No, the, the gray. gray. 